couple months back, I wanted to know more about the Old West. So I did a deep dive on YouTube and I looked at probably 30, 40 different channels because I wanted to do a show specifically on that period. And uh, honestly, the Arizona Ghost Riders by far is the most engaging content out there on the matter. I mean, it's the only show that has both a mischievous ghost and a CGI dinosaur. CGI? <laughs> uh, so let me ask you there, uh, Santi, how did this all get started? How did you uh, get into, uh, well, I guess so we'll rewind. What made you want to start the Arizona Ghost Riders? Well, to be honest, I didn't actually start the Arizona Ghost Riders. Uh, a fellow reenactor named uh, Jim Wells actually started the Arizona Ghost Riders way back in the day. And we were all part of a different group. Okay. Our group kind of fell apart as groups do. And we started as a collective, four or five of us, we started the Arizona Ghost Riders together. And, and he'd already had the name because of a previous group. Um, and he sold it to me back in 2016, 17, 2017. He sold it back. He sold it to me. So I've had it ever since then. Awesome. So, so I guess then how long have you been uh, in the reenactment community? Ever since I moved out to Arizona in 2001. Okay. So was, uh, I don't know. So was that your first, um, was that your first uh, inkling to get into reenacting? Did you like go to reenactment and just get inspired to get in the community or like, what was the driving force behind that? Well, okay, let's go all the way back, back to the 60s, 60s, 60s. Um, I was, uh, I grew up watching Westerns as most people in my generation, prior generations did. Uh, and I just fell in love with them. And I thought, boy, if I could ever do that, that'd be awesome. Uh, fast forward to about 1994. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm now of age to buy a gun by myself. And the first gun I want is a Colt single action army. Of course, I didn't realize those were about $1,200. So I settled for a replica and I started doing cowboy action shooting, which was available where I lived in New York City at the time. Not in New York City. They, they frowned upon that, you know, <laughs> shooting in central parks and all that stuff. Uh, so we would, we would shoot and I started getting the cowboy action shooting. I thought, wow, this is cool. Not quite what I wanted, you know, and I moved out to Arizona 2001 and I thought there's got to be something more than cowboy action shooting for me. Yeah. And so I joined a reenactment group because I thought that might be fun. And that was the missing thing. The, the theatrical or the entertainment part of it was what was missing, you know, being able to shoot your friends as weird as that sounds. Yeah. I mean, I've, I've only done one reenactment and uh, my buddy, Zach, he, he is a, well, he was a history major. We met in college and he is a really, really big uh, history buff. I mean, he is uh, primarily focused on uh, so right before the civil war up until the industrial revolution, like that is his thing. So I went to a civil wow. war reenactment there with him and uh, you know, it was mostly uh, just playing around a bond bonfire picking at my banjo but just that sense of camaraderie that you get when you're actually camping out you know in in the um in that era everything around you i mean it's just a surreal experience and it kind of makes you so appreciative of you know not only everything we have now but everything that our forefathers went through in those rougher days past yeah that's and it the civil war reenactors are pretty hardcore um i've talked to a few of them and they're Whew, I tell you, they really do a lot of research. Oh, yeah. I'm so impressed with them. I've been to a couple of, uh, what would you call them? Uh, living history events, I guess, okay. where out here they encompass a lot of different eras. And the Civil War, the Mountain Men, boy, those, those guys are really hardcore. Uh, and it's, uh, it's impressive because it helps bring my level of, of um, uh, originality, not originality, my level of, of professionalism up a mm -hmm. lot more, you know? Yeah. And uh, I mean, it was definitely an intense experience, but, you know, I think that's one of the reasons why I enjoy reenacting, uh, you know, the kind of stuff that you guys do with you with the live shows is that, um, 
I don't know, you're able to get a lot of humor out of it. And, you know, the more you can make someone laugh, the more you can get them engaged with the material, the more of it they're going to retain because it has that emotional connection, right? Um, and then that's one thing, you know, looking at your guys' YouTube channel, all the different topics that you discuss. I mean, a lot of it is topics that people aren't normally going to think of, but that are interesting, right? You know, like hygiene in the old West, specific types of um, specific types of clothing. Um, actually, I had to uh, use one of your tips to get this guy out of storage. And I actually uh, sat and steamed it and reformed it earlier today. You know, that, that hat looks, uh, I wasn't going to mention it, but that hat looks uh, surprisingly like the one I use for my drunk, uh, my drunk outfit. It just doesn't yeah. have the hand on the top. So it looks very similar. <laughs> Yeah. You know, I had a uh, I had a band that would go around it that I had like a nice like uh, turquoise buckle on with a bunch of feathers and stuff. But well, after a weekend at a festival out in the rain, that just went away real oh, quick. Man, uh, so I got to build another one up. But I mean, I, I guess that's the one thing about reenacting as well that like the the type of character that you choose. I mean, you can really bring out parts of yourself that you know you normally wouldn't have a other way of expressing. You know what I mean? Um, so that's the one thing I love about reenactments as well is that when the crowd itself, you know, the people actually come get into character, enjoy themselves. I mean, it really is uh, fun to see what kind of characters they create and you know what kind of things they bring to the table themselves. Yeah, I agree with you. It's um, it, there's a little bit of a difference, in my opinion, between Old West reenactment and living history. So mm -hmm. when you go to a Civil War event, they're reenactors, and, and I guess they're also doing living history because they're probably bivouacking or, uh, is, that, is that the term? Bivouacking? Oh, that sounds weird. Is that right? <laughs> they're camping out, and they get the fire. They're sleeping out of the stars. They're drinking coffee out of a tin cup, the whole thing, um, and, um, and not bathing, probably. But when we do reenactments in the Old West, they're 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 not always reenactments. I, I like to stay away from that word and go to gunfight show, which is okay. what we do, because because the shows that we're doing may or may not have ever happened. Um, we we base them in fact. Usually, it's it's centered around outlaws that uh, think they're smarter than they actually are, which is not unusual in the Old West. Um, but but they're not necessarily things that actually happened. Out here in Arizona, uh, you can you can throw a dart and hit an OK Corral reenactment <laughs> anytime you throw it. Uh, they're all over the place, but we we tend to not do those just for the mere fact that there are other people doing them. And like you said, humor is a big part of it. So we try to we try to really engage the audience and and get them involved with it. You know, it's it's silly, but it's still history if you can put those two together. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Well, I think when you put silliness and history together, that's when you, you know, start to uh, actually have an, an entertaining historical experience. Now, uh, let me ask you, you know, we were talking about how uh, at reenactments, people develop their own characters. Um, so was Santee your original character that you did for these shows? Or have you had a few different ones over the t over the years? Oh, you know, I play a different character in probably every show. Um if you think about it as sort of a, a repertory group, you know, where everybody plays different parts. Okay. Um, that's kind of what it is. Santee is really just the alias of, of who I am. Um, you could probably guess from watching my videos that I'm usually the goofy, um, usually the goofy townsperson, or mm -hmm. uh, sometimes I play the gunfighter, but for the most time, most part, I'm, I'm usually the bumbling fool, uh, which um, is my middle name in high school, Bumbling Fool. So, yeah. <laughs> is that what they gave you on the yearbook too? Most likely to be Bumbling Fool. <laughs> no, no, they said you already were one. <laughs> It's, yeah, I mean, uh, looking at the videos, you know, you're always more the comic relief. And then uh, usually, um, I want to say it was what, Dirty Dan plays the straight man. Um, and, you know, that uh, that relationship is so important in, in comedy. I mean, you go back to even like, you know, uh, Laurel and Hardy, Abbott and Costello, like you always have to have your comic relief paired with a good straight man. And you guys right. have found that balance, which I can appreciate. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate that. We have fun doing them, as I'm sure you understand. It's just it's sometimes it's it's hard to keep a straight face you know 
Yeah, absolutely. Well, I mean, particularly when you're, uh, you know, infusing like different movie clips, we had already talked about the dinosaur and the mischievous ghost. So I guess what made you want to um, kind of have these different recurring characters and not just play it more for, uh, you know, like a straight historical documentary? Well, if you watch the first, when I first started the channel, it was really, I just wanted to to show everybody about reenact, show everybody what reenactment living history was. And I didn't really have, I had this vlog idea that I was just going to sit in front of the camera, kind of mm-hmm. like I'm doing now, and just talk to people. And I got bored with that real quick and thought, you know, I need to really perform. I need to be out there doing stuff and doing skits and things. So when I did the Bill Brazelton episode the first time, I thought, well, they talk about his ghost being um, prevalent in the area. And I thought, wouldn't it be kind of neat if his ghost followed me home? kind of like haunted mansion and uh so i just thought he'd be my comic relief when dan's not available or arizona red or bat jack or any of those other people you see jerry woods any of those people you see they're all working so i can't always work with them so i can always work with bill brazelton so there you go yeah and uh i mean bill brazelton as well you know the historical figure um yeah. is he's such an interesting character um just oh, because yeah. of uh, i mean he was uh i don't want to say the most renowned gunslinger in the west but he's definitely the most notorious well it was really yeah you know it's funny is there's just not a lot known about him you know there's more there's more info on people like jesse james and billy the kid than there is on bill brazelton in fact we're not even sure that's his real name so hmm. It's a, but he apparently was very good with a gun and he, uh, he was smart. So now have you ever gone through and uh, compared the kill counts of different, uh, of different historical gunslingers? Because like, I don't know, a lot of them are actually tall tales. Uh, I mean, you look at, uh, how they, how the folk stories around like Jesse James, Billy, the kid, I mean, how they were really used at the time is like, I don't want to say marketing or branding, but, you know, they were building an image for themselves. And uh, that's what helped them escape justice a few different times was having the people on their side. But uh, with Brazelton, you don't really hear too many like tall tales. There's no store or there's no uh, folk, bold folk songs written about him. So he really is a mysterious character. And uh, I mean, it's interesting that, you know, back in the day, you really didn't have... um, documentation like you have nowadays so people could change their names and uh, you know you really wouldn't know the true story on someone yeah absolutely you're absolutely right i mean they didn't have id cards back then that they they flashed whenever they went into a, a county oh wait do we do that now i haven't done uh jury duty in so long i can't remember do you have to show your id anyway <laughs> i haven't yeah, done whatever jury the case years. you're you're absolutely right yeah people back then could could choose an alias. Many of these, if you look at some of these gunslingers, and uh, and that is an okay term to use, uh, outlaws, gunslingers, people like that, they did they did just seamlessly change their names. Some of them have three and four aliases. Yeah. Um, Butch Cassidy is actually not Butch Cassidy. I can't remember his real name, but uh, um, th- there's just a lot of them out there. Harry Longball was Sundance Kid. You know that was where did they come up with these? Well, Jesse James, I believe, was actually Jesse Woodson James. But, uh, you know, this is this is a guy coming out of the Civil War. Mm -hmm. Everybody knew him in the area. So, yeah, I often uh, well, what was the gunslinger that uh, he actually killed the lawman that was chasing and then assumed his identity and then went back and continued a career in law enforcement or it could have been a bounty hunter. I don't I don't know the specifics. I was watching. Uh, I was watching uh, one of the, one of uh, those like uh, gunslinger documentaries, and they were talking about a guy who had done that because you know really all you needed was those tin badges back then, and a lot of times they there wasn't like a uniformity on how they were made and like a rank associated with them. Well, that's true, and and a lot of the times sheriffs, marshals, and sheriffs were basically hired for their ability to. Uh, to shoot and to be not afraid to pull the trigger because because people needed law and order and there wasn't a whole lot of it out there at the time so it's not unheard of uh that you would have a guy that was an outlaw be your marshal of your town you know because yeah. hey at least he can use a gun and he ain't afraid to use it but uh yeah i don't know the story of that guy i'll have to look that up that's really interesting mm-hmm.